Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the adaptations of cave-dwelling animals. So, let's jump right in. Numerous times in Earth's history, different species have independently adapted to similar circumstances with similar solutions. This process is called convergent evolution. In some instances, convergent evolution reflects the physical constraints of a given problem, for which there is only one or a few options to resolve. Classic examples include the convergent evolution of powered flight and the streamlined bodies of aquatic animals. Large, flying organisms like birds, bats, and pterosaurs require paired airfoils to generate lift, while the streamlined body of sharks, whales, and many fish is the optimal shape to minimize drag. Other examples suggest many factors are in play. One famous example is that a variety of crustacean lineages have evolved to look like crabs, which is called carcinization. Cave environments offer further cases, such as a suite of features collectively called troglomorphism, including skin without pigments and reduced to absent eyes, which was originally thought to evolve only in response to chronic cave dwelling. As it happens, troglomorphic features can evolve outside of caves too, such as in shallow subterranean habitats, and not all animals that regularly inhabit caves are troglomorphic. Broadly, it appears that animals who live in perpetually low-like environments, and do so for thousands to millions of years, are the ones most likely to become troglomorphic. However, that is not always the case. One of the first well-known examples of troglomorphism was the European ulm, Proteus anguinus, discovered in the 1700s. This elongate salamander lacks skin pigments and eyes, and has highly reduced limbs but the ulm has increased its taste buds to compensate for a lack of sight. In the southeastern USA, there is the unpigmented Georgia blind salamander, Eurycia wallacei, that is preyed upon by the equally unpigmented cave crawfish, Cambarus cryptodides. And in Texas aquifers, swim blind cave catfish like Satan Eurystomus, who appear to be related to the larger surface dwelling flathead catfish, Pylodictus olivaris. Bizarrely, the Gobi family Milioringidae contains only two genera, both of which have independently adapted to cave environments, the genus Milioringia in northwest Australia and Tifliotris in Madagascar. Another fish example, one which has even made its way into the aquarium hobby, is the Mexican blind cave tetra Astyanax mexicanus, largely native to the limestone Sierra del Abra cave complex. What makes this tetra so special is that there are multiple extant morphs of it, a surface-dwelling morph with eyes and pigmentation versus cave-dwelling morphs that have largely, or totally, lost both. The tetras evidently arrived in Mexico at least 3 million years ago, first colonizing the El Abra caves, and then other populations colonized the western Mikos caves about 2.1 million years ago. Both cave systems were repeatedly colonized by the tetras. Further, these populations show different degrees of adaptations to the cave environments. The younger Mikos populations have reduced eye size and pigmentation, but not totally lost. However, the older El Abra populations have completely lost both. So, we can find essentially all stages of the evolution of troglomorphism here. Furthermore, surface and cave dwellers are still able to interbreed. When a surface dweller is crossed with a completely blind cave morph, the hybrid offspring often regain eyes, albeit the eyes are often reduced with respect to the surface dwelling ancestor. With further crosses, the genetic loci that correlate with the differences between these morphs can be mapped onto the genome, which helps scientists to identify genes that are involved in generating these different traits. One thing that needs to be preemptively rebuffed is the notion of de-evolution. 
Those who don't like evolutionary science often scoff at examples of evolution like these as mere losses or the reduction of things. However, these cave fish didn't just lose eyes and skin pigmentation. They also gained traits to adapt to their new circumstances. They have larger jaws with more maxillary teeth, which helps them catch prey. Food in these caves is often very scarce, so even a slightly higher prey catch rate can make the difference between surviving and starving. Additionally, to compensate for the loss of sight, these fish have heightened other senses. They have more taste buds, even on the outside of their mouth. Fish also have what's called lateral line organs with neuromasts that include sensory hair cells, which detect the movement of the fluid in the lateral line organs, producing a neural signal. This is similar to the hair cells in our inner ears, which are involved in our sense of hearing and balance. Indeed, it's likely that our inner ear and the lateral line organs of fish are evolutionarily related systems. In any case, fish use their neuromasts to essentially listen with their skin, detecting the vibrations and pressure changes in the surrounding water. Cave fish have enhanced this sense with an extensive lateral line system with a greater number of neuromasts that are also individually bigger. After discussing troglomorphic animals, Dawkins and Wong take the, in my opinion, odd turn to discuss Dalo's Law of Irreversibility, which refers to the general inability of a trait to revert to an ancestral stage. They pose the question, is the loss of eyes in the blind cave fish an example of trait reversal? I've personally never encountered this question, but we can pursue it. The answer is no. The Tetras didn't backtrack through eye evolution as an adaptation to the cave environment. Eye development begins, but is arrested, during their embryonic development. It's also worth noting that Dalo's law is less of a law and more of a statistical trend. The more generations pass and variations accrue, the less likely that a trait can revert to an earlier form. Intriguingly, there appear to be exceptions to this rule, such as the reacquisition of wings in stick insects, order Phasmatodia. The common ancestor of all extant stick insects seems to have been wingless, but a massive phylogenetic analysis found that wings re-evolved at least nine times, and possibly as many as 36 times. So, that's the blind cavefish's tale. Various animals have convergently adapted to life in caves, and their adaptations often include a loss of eyes and pigmentation. These animals are not reverting to earlier stages of their evolutionary history in developing these adaptations, but are instead building the adaptations atop existing biological structures. That is how evolution works, after all. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.